everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. A lot of Oklahoma producers are wondering how the recent freeze impacted two of our state's important crops. We begin with wheat and our extension small grain specialist, Jeff Edwards. Across most of Oklahoma last week, we dropped down into the 20s and some parts of Oklahoma even into the upper teens. That was certainly cold enough that we would have expected quite a bit of freeze injury. Every freeze event is, is different and this one, this one was a bit unusual. Wheat that was in the boot stage or maybe just poking out of the head that we would have expected severe injury seems to have avoided most of the injury and we're looking at anywhere from no injury to 10 or maybe 15%. Wheat that was smaller around the two joint stage or wheat that was very drought stressed in western Oklahoma and southwest Oklahoma was hit the hardest and it finished off a lot of that drought stressed crop and in northern Oklahoma along the Kansas border and on it, all the way into the panhandle we had severe tissue injury and the jury's still out on that wheat as far as whether or not it's going to be able to recover. So as far as the damage we're seeing out in the field, it's very evident right now where if wheat is injured, the heads will either be white, they'll be blanked out, or you'll find some heads that are actually trapped uh, and have come out like they were uh, injured by 2,4-D. As far as the overall impact on the Oklahoma wheat crop, it's really tough to say because it was very variable. You will have a pocket uh, or an area where there's severe injury and then just maybe 10 or 15 miles down the road or maybe even just a mile or two, there's no injury at all. So it's really hard to get a handle on how much impact it's going to have on the wheat crop as a whole. Of course, wheat isn't the only crop well on its way to harvest. To check on the popular oil seed, here's Oklahoma State University canola specialist Josh Bouchong. Freeze definitely made an impact on the canola crop. Some guys were almost unscathed by it and some were hit a little bit harder by it, especially low-lying areas where the frost really settled in. Some of the fields where we didn't see a significant impact from the freeze, uh, the crop the morning of the freeze was kind of curved over and later that day the crop mostly stood back up. You can kind of see that worth a lot of the stems kind of have an S shape in them. The next morning, that Wednesday morning, we had some big wind storms come through and that probably did more damage than the freeze event itself. The freeze softened the cells or the structure of the stem, uh, made it vulnerable to the wind, and we had quite a few areas where the stem, maybe 10 to 14 inches off the ground, uh, kinked over. The plant, if it is kinked, will never upright again, but all the branches on that kink stem uh, will right themselves and go growing back uh, vertical. But for the most part, the racine is usually the biggest component of the yield. Uh, minor cases during the freeze event, the flowers that were open uh, went sterile. And so you can see we have some aborted pods as well as some pods that might only have a few seeds in there. So those pot or those flowers that were open during the freeze event uh, probably won't set any seeds, but the stuff before is still looking great and the stuff after the freeze event is still looking pretty good. Uh, but for the most part, our biggest issue right now is drought stress. If you'd like to get out in the field with Josh, Jeff, and other members of our crops and extension team, join us on May 9th at the North Central Research Station Wheat Field Day at Lahoma. Registration starts at 8.40 a.m. and Edwards tells us there will be a variety of research on display. Producers are going to see some of the most current research that we're doing in winter wheat and even canola. Uh, we're going to have highlights of our breeding program with Dr. Carver and Dr. Hunger. We're going to cover the most current varieties. We're going to look at weed control and uh, canola management, crop rotation. Randy Taylor is going to be there talking about drills, drill calibration. Kim Anderson is going to be there talking about our current price outlook and Jody Campici is on the tour talking about our new farm bill and how that's going to impact producers. For information on the Wheat Field Day at Lahoma, check out our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report.
Spring can be a wild time for weather in Oklahoma. One of the ways you can stay on top of what is happening is by turning to the Mesonet forecast page on the Mesonet.org website. This page features graphical forecast information from the four National Weather Service offices that cover Oklahoma. This provides a single location where you can quickly scan severe weather types and timing of events as they typically unfold from west to east. Wednesday was a prime example of the range of weather over several days. The Norman Forecast Office graphics included a map of severe weather timing for Wednesday afternoon and evening, a second graphic with the hail size and wind hazards. A graphic from the Tulsa Forecast Office showed there was a limited risk of storms early Thursday morning. For Saturday, the Norman Forecast Office pointed to the likelihood of storms rolling in again. Sunday was forecast to begin with a chance of storms across central Oklahoma and high fire danger in the west. A lot of severe weather in just a couple of days. Displayed maps are updated as soon as they become available, so you can use this page to track events as they occur. Here's Gary with a longer look at our weather. Thanks, Al, and good morning, everybody. Now, despite the rainfall we saw last weekend, I'm afraid drought is still making significant strides across the state and in some important wheat-producing areas of the state as well. So let's take a look at the latest U.S. drought monitor map. We did see much more expansion of drought than we did relief. The largest expansion occurred across the important wheat-producing areas of north-central Oklahoma, where that red extreme drought, or D3 drought, made a huge jump to the east. So why this jump in drought intensity despite the rainfall? Well, if you look at the year-to-date Mesonet rainfall maps, at least through Wednesday, you can see why. Basically, the northwestern half of the state is still well below normal, with less than two inches in general being reported for the year thus far northwest of the I-44 corridor. The statewide average for this period was about 3.8 inches of rainfall, which is mostly across eastern Oklahoma, that's more than five inches below normal on a statewide average basis. The percent of normal rainfall map shows that much of the state has seen from 40% to less than 20% of normal rainfall since the beginning of the year. Now the latest U.S. seasonal drought outlook, which is good for the current period through the end of July, unfortunately still sees that drought persisting across the western half of Oklahoma with some improvements possible in the east and downright drought removal across farther to the east. So eastern Oklahoma, that's pretty good news. Western Oklahoma, we're just going to have to hope that this map turns out to be wrong. So hopefully we've gotten some rainfall this weekend with a little less severe weather than what was expected. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Unlike the wind today, it's been a quiet week in the wheat markets. Kim, what's been happening? Well, the wheat market has established a sideways pattern. You look at the Kansas City July contract, uh, the KC contract is trading between uh, about uh, $7.20 and $8. It does have some resistance at uh, about $7.80. Uh, you look at corn, it's, it is it. Corn is in an uptrend right now. It's trading between 495 and 515. It's got to break that 515 to keep going that up. Of course, that's on the December contract. I think the news in the market this week that I don't know that anybody's gotten a hold of is that several large banks have taken their money out of the commodities. That's the would be funds money. If more banks and more investors pull out of commodities, it'll be interesting to see if taking dollars out of a you know a market has any what price impact that has. And of course, what everybody's talking about is the weather. That's right, a lot of prayers were answered this last week and a lot of rain fell. What does that mean for wheat producers? Well, a lot of rain fell in a few places, but I think overall we did we got insufficient uh, rain to, to save the crop. Uh, talking to uh, crop adjusters, insurance adjusters, they're really working southern Oklahoma, east, uh, western Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle, those areas up to West Kansas. There's a lot of ac insurance activity going on there. 
like I said, not enough to save the crop. I think the question is, is are we going to get enough moisture to, for what we harvest? Is it going to be a milling quality? You, you, know, you brought that up uh, the last week on the quality of, of the crop, and I think that's the important question right now. Okay, what, what does the uh, market have to offer as far as prices go? Well, if you look at uh, wheat uh, on, on uh, marketing, that uh, basis is about 40 under 35 to 45 uh, under the Ju that uh, July contract price. Uh, you look at uh, corn, it's about 33 under, unless you're in the panhandle of Texas or Oklahoma, and then it's about 15 cents over. Sorghum is uh, about 11 cents uh, lower than corn uh, forward contract price, except in the panhandle. Sorghum is 44 under the Chicago December, all the way across the board, central Oklahoma. And you look at canola, you can uh, forward contract somewhere between 880 and $9, somewhere in that range. Okay, one more thing. This wind kind of reminds me of Lahoma Field Days, and you're, gonna, and you're actually going to be there May 9th. Uh, you bet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to present at least this title, guaranteed price forecast. We're going to uh, give that forecast for June and December of 2014. Okay, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. After a pretty long cold winter. Some cows in your herd may be in a little thinner body condition coming out of the calving season than you, you would have liked, especially in the case of young cows, two-year-olds, three-year-olds. A management practice that you may want to consider in that situation is what we call short-term calf removal. And that is just the, the practice of separating the cows and the calves just with one fence for at least 48 hours. And what we're trying to do here is to fool Mother Nature. We're trying to fool the endocrine system of that uh, cow into thinking that she's weaned that calf and perhaps allow uh, a, a release of some of the hormones that allow her to start to recycle to have a chance to rebreed a little sooner for next year's calf crop. Short-term calf removal has been studied pretty extensively in several different experiments. What we're seeing here is the results of three different trials done in Kansas back in the 80s. What they did was take a body condition score four and five adult cows and separated their calves for that two day period of time. The cows that had the calves separated had a little higher rebreeding percentage, about 6%. And as you look through the data on this subject, you'll see the range is, is pretty narrow. Four to eight percent is about as much as we can expect. If the cows are in real good body condition at calving time, this quite frankly won't have much advantage. And by the way, if cows are very, very thin at calving, this just isn't a powerful enough tool to help those as well. We're probably going to have to look at something more dramatic such as complete weaning of the calves. Now you might be concerned about whether that two-day separation of the calf from the cow will have an adverse effect on the health and the growth of those calves. The research says no. That as we look at the uh, average daily gain of the calves from the time that this takes place until they're weaned, it's identical to that of their counterparts that stayed on the cow and, and suckled all the way through. So this is a management tool that we can use in those few situations where you have some two and three year old cows that are kind of marginal in body condition. We might be able to get just a few more of those to cycle and to rebreed on time for next year's calf crop by trying this management procedure that we call short term calf removal. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about motor oils and classifications and the differences between uh, those two. So there's a, a standardized what they call donut set up by the American Petroleum Institute and it's on basically every jug of oil and you can see that on both of these jugs. So the Petroleum Institute basically sets minimum qualifications or minimum standards for motor oils and, uh, and once if the oil meets that minimum standard then it'll have that classification on it. And For uh, spark ignition engines they started at SA back many many years ago and now we're all the way to SM is the, is the current or actually SN is the current uh, 
uh, classification for motor oil. And then for the compression engines, they start with a C and all the way up to where right now CJ4, and that's for the tier four engines uh, that can actually handle that. One of the things about the, the especially the, the motor oils for, for diesel engines is uh, you need to think about the, uh, the tier fours and what they're using for their uh, emissions control on those engines. So you really need to check the operator's manual for your engine and it will tell you what the minimum classification of motor oil that you need. And if you go out to the API website, they have a chart of what oils are obsolete and what takes their place and you can look at that and see what the, the newest classifications of oils are uh, and see the actual donut there on their site. So that doesn't tell you whether one oil is better than another oil, but it will tell you that this specific oil meets the minimum criteria for that classification. So that's a little bit about oil here on Shop Stop. We'll see you next time. Fire is an important part of Oklahoma's natural landscape, but its role is more complex than previously thought. SUNUP's Austin Moore takes us to Osage County to explain. The Tallgrass Prairie Preserve that the Nature Conservancy manages is a wonderful outdoor laboratory. There's questions we can ask here that we can't ask anywhere else in Oklahoma. They try to mimic what, what we think happened in Tallgrass Prairie, sort of pre-settlement or pre-sort of urbanization and agriculture, and that's that fire and grazing are allowed to interact. So they randomly burn areas, and after they burn them, as you can see, grazers are drawn to that burn area. It's got lush regrowth, it's got high protein, and as one of my colleagues put it, it's kind of like comparing a salad to a two by four. So they're gonna select this lush regrowth as opposed to areas that haven't been burned in a couple of years. These shorter sections of prairie grass have another use as well. This is where greater prairie chickens come to mate. Prairie chickens are a good indicator of the overall health so to speak, of the, of the prairie. Since they need all the different time since fires or all the different plant structures, if you've got them on the landscape, it's a good indication that all the other wildlife species are gonna have um, the right habitat components as well. So they're kind of a good canary in the coal mine, so to speak, for uh, other wildlife species. That's why this team of scientists from Oklahoma State University yeah. comes to the like tall grass that. prairie yeah. preserve. Over the first three years of this study, they looked into nesting ecology. But now in their fourth year... Basically what we do is capture these birds in the spring when they're on the lek, which is where the males congregate to breed. And we fit them with transmitters that allows us to see where the birds go, what kinds of uh, plant communities they use, what their home range, and what their survival is. So what we're interested in is is being able to provide uh, livestock producers and land managers with some guidance on things that they can do that not only benefit livestock production but also will keep prairie grouse, prairie chickens, and other wildlife species on the landscape. While the birds prefer shorter, more recently burned grasses for booming, they need the taller, unburned grasses like this for nesting cover. Birds typically lack in areas that have been recently disturbed, so areas that don't have a lot of vegetation, um, presumably so they can see predators as they approach lek sites, but then birds also need other parts of the landscape that are unburned. So the majority of the nests that I've monitored have been er in areas that haven't been burned in greater than two years. So areas with taller vegetation, more litter accumulations, presumably so they can seal the nest from predators, but also through my research we found that those areas tend to be cooler. Uh, and then on top of that, they also have a, a life cycle where they have their chicks when they're brooding, and they seem to take birds out in areas that have been burned, uh, you know, about a year ago, maybe up to two years ago, that have more forbs, kind of a, a canopy. If you think of it like a forest, you know, it has kind of a canopy of forbs, but it has less litter, so they're able to move their brood through there and forage on insects. So they really require varying times post fire and grazing for all of the life cycles or all of their life history traits throughout their life cycle. The other thing we've seen is they avoid tree cover. So having fire on the landscape is critical to keep prairies open and woody covered out. But having some areas unburned in a given year are really important for nesting. So it just really points to the fact that everything shouldn't look the same. 
we need burned areas, we need some unburned areas. That knowledge should give Oklahoma's greater prairie chickens something to boom about. We smoke meats primarily for three reasons, for flavor, aroma, and appearance. Those are desirable attributes from smoke that we often like to see in meat products. Smoking meats is quite simple. It's either the result of burning wood and applying the smoke to the product or applying a, a manufactured liquid smoke. The end result or the end uh, desire is the same. The smoke is comprised of at least 400 compounds that we've identified, maybe well over a thousand, but we're only interested in three compounds that impact the meat and the traits that we're looking for. Those three compounds are acids, phenols, and carbonyls. The acids contribute to a forming of a protein skin, drying out of the product, and creating that, uh, that texture to the outer surface of a smoked product. The phenols in smoke contribute to the smoked flavor, and that's why we apply smoke, because it's really a different and unique flavor than a non-smoked product. Finally, the carbonyls, they impact our eyes. They make smoked uh, meats as attractive as we like to see them, and we often refer to an attractive mahogany color for a properly smoked meat. Now, we can apply smoke in two different methods, one from the simple burning of sawdust or hardwood, or two, from the application of a manufactured smoke we call liquid smoke. The result is the same. Both products apply the acids and the phenols and the carbonyls and result in the same smoke appearance and flavor and aroma. The advantages of one over the other is that the natural hardwood smoke, you're burning wood. You have a fire and there's some romance associated with that and you see that oftentimes at weekend barbecue competitions. The advantage to liquid smoke is consistency. We reduce the biological variation we see in trees and hardwood and sawdust that comes from that biological system. It's more efficient, it's more consistent, and it's much more controllable. Now to a preview of an upcoming documentary on OETA, commemorating 100 years of Oklahoma Extension. At noon on April 22, 1889, settlers lined up for the first Oklahoma land run. By the end of the day, cities like Oklahoma City and Guthrie would come into existence with at least 10,000 new citizens. But many of the settlers were not looking for life in the towns and cities, but somewhere to grow crops and raise livestock. They wanted to be farmers. And this posed a problem. Little was known about the climate or soils in the new territory. These new farmers weren't quite sure what to plant or even how to farm this land. We assumed that most of these people who came here had come from farming backgrounds, but many people had not. Uh, there was a first opportunity to own land. It took a while to figure out what was going to grow well in different parts of the state. One crop that did well was cotton, particularly in southern Oklahoma. King cotton, as it was called during the Civil War, still dominated the South. The yearly cotton crops fed Follow local cotton gins town. before being shipped to textile mills on the East Buy Coast. But in 1892, the Mexican boll weevil crossed the Rio Grande River into Texas. When walking cross his field, boll weevil took his cotton and turned the corn to me. But unfortunately, that weevil, probably the worst cotton pest that you could ever imagine. Boll weevil take a circle. The beetle fed on cotton buds and flowers and spread at a rate of 60 miles per year throughout the South. Entire farms and even towns were abandoned as it moved into new areas. In an effort to save the industry, the federal government turned to a past college administrator and agriculturalist by the name of Seaman Knapp. While serving as president of Iowa State College, 
Knapp started a campus farm to experiment with local crops and production methods. It was so successful that he was asked to help write the Hatch Act, a federal law that established similar experimental farms at every agricultural college throughout the U.S. But farmers often never heard about or ignored the new discoveries and farm practices made at these facilities. What was needed was a way to extend this knowledge directly to the farmer. People like Seaman Knapp come along and they figure out that it's very, very critical to take scientific knowledge that's being developed and being able to produce food. You just can't take science and say to a farmer or a, an average citizen, here, take it, do what you want to with it. You've got to have people that can translate that. Knapp began by setting up a demonstration farm in Terrell, Texas. The Porter family agreed to farm 70 acres of cotton as directed by Knapp. Local businessmen put up $1,000 as a guarantee in case the crop failed. It didn't. Porter's harvest was twice as large as in previous years. The demonstration farm was so successful that in 1904 Congress appropriated funds for Knapp to form the Office of Farmers Cooperative Demonstration Work. The documentary 100 Years of Oklahoma Extension premieres Thursday, May 8th at 7 p.m. on OETA. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube and other social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.